Welcome. It's that time again for another segment of In the Know, Sunday School Lesson Review for Sunday, March the 31st, 2024. Happy Resurrection Sunday. If you are new to my channel, my name is Elder Chris Eady, and I try to deep dive into the church school lesson each week. And if you find this study helpful, informative, and enjoyable, please let me know by clicking that like button and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. So without further ado, let us pray before getting into the word of God. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for another day's journey. Thank you for your Son and thank you for your Spirit. Now, Lord, enlighten us with your word. Give us wisdom and comprehension. Prepare our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word. Please give clarity and understanding as your word is being taught and presented today. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the spring quarter, unit one, faithful versus faithless. And the subject of this particular lesson is the resurrection key to faith, the resurrection key to faith. And our text is taken from Mark 16, 1 through 8, Mark 16, 1 through 8. And our key verse to remember is taken from the sixth verse of the 16th chapter of Mark, which says, And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now, some facts concerning the resurrection Jesus' empty tomb was proof he had risen. And the principle of this lesson is, regardless of our situations in life, we still must have faith. And we must share the good news that Christ is not dead, but he is still alive. And to understand... Uh, the writings of Mark, you must understand these things. The book of Mark is one of the four gospels and the shortest of the four. It was written by John Mark. John was a Jewish name, but Mark was a Gentile name. It's possible Mark became saved listening to Peter's preaching. And according to tradition, this book appears to have been the first gospel written because Matthew and Luke takes information from Mark and expands upon it. There's very few incidents which are recorded in the book of Mark that are not found in either Matthew or Luke's gospel. The gospel of Mark contains none of Christ's birth narrative. Mark focuses on the ministry of Jesus and shows him as the servant of God. He doesn't talk about how or where the servant was born. He doesn't record the genealogy of the servant. To Mark, the most important thing about a servant is what he does. So John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. And as a way of introduction into our text today, Easter or Resurrection Sunday, is one of the most celebrated days on the Christian calendar. Resurrection is all about hope, new life, and new beginnings, and not necessarily death. The resurrection is the central theme or the central message of the gospel. It is the object of our faith because it is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection didn't take place, then Christianity would be a false religion and our living for him would be in vain. But the resurrection did take place and it's a powerful message that can still change lives. The question that every child of God must answer is, 
What am I doing with the message of the resurrection? Is it making a difference in my life as well? If we want to make a difference in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, as well in the world as a whole, we must be willing to share the message of the resurrection with everyone that we come in contact with. The resurrection impacted the lives of Christ's disciples, and it should impact our lives as well. The resurrection is the foundation for our Christian belief. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we know death is not the end of us. Jesus' resurrection confirmed that he's more than a good teacher. He's more than a spiritual leader. It confirmed that he is the son of the living God. And resurrection means to come back to life after having once died. Jesus himself resurrected Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, as well as Lazarus. The Bible uses the word resurrection in three different contexts. It refers to the miraculous raising of the dead back to earthly life. It refers to Jesus' triumph over death and the grave. It refers to the extralogical resurrection of mankind at the end of time. So this brings us to the first section of our lesson outline entitled, The Faith of the Woman at Their Arrival at the Empty Tomb. The Faith of the women at their arrival at the empty tomb. And on that resurrection morning, no one really was looking for a risen Christ. The disciples were locked away behind closed doors, fearing that the Jews might come and kill them. Later on that day, a couple of disciples was walking to Emmaus, talking about what happened and how terrible things had turned out. And before sunrise, a few loyal and faithful women went to the tomb to anoint the body of Christ. They too thought he was still dead. They came to finish the work Joseph had started, and that was to complete the anointing process for a proper burial. According to Mark, in verse 1, it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, there were the brave and courageous women that got up early in the morning to finish a work Joseph and Nicodemus had started. The men Christ had personally handpicked and chosen was hiding in fear, hiding behind locked doors. And the phrase that they might come and anoint him indicates these women considered Christ to be permanently dead. They didn't come to the tomb expecting to find it empty. These women came to perform a specific Jewish burial custom. Let me explain. Jewish people didn't embalm their dead. So in order to cover up the smell of a dead body, they would anoint that body with precious ointments. Some commentators believe these women had left the scene before Pilate had even given his stamp of approval to officially seal the tomb and have soldiers to guard it. They didn't even know how they were going to roll the huge stone away, but they went there in faith Anyhow, it would have been helpful 
here to know that a Jewish day begins and ends at sundown or sunset. Therefore, a Jewish Sabbath is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Is that true? If that's true, why didn't the women go to the tomb after sundown on Saturday? Why did they wait just before dawn that Sunday? All four gospel accounts reveals that the women came at the same time of the day. According to verse two, very early in the morning, the first day of the week at the rising of the sun. Very early in the morning, the sunlight had just begun to penetrate the darkness. In other words, it was still dark when the women started out towards the tomb. The first day of the week, which is Sunday, is when Jesus arose from the grave. The first day of the week is when the New Testament church was established. At the first day of the week is the day that the early Christians decided to worship God. Dealing with the complexities and the problems of life is no easy task. Feeling overwhelmed by our circumstances that's impossible for us to control is a powerless feeling. Like the followers of Christ, we often wonder whether there's any real hope. This passage of scripture indicates these women didn't believe or expected Jesus to be resurrected. Just like the disciples, they had forgotten all about what Jesus had already told them, that he would be falsely accused, that he would be unjustly tried, and that he would be mistreated and killed. But three days later, rise again. And according to verse three, in all of their planning, in all of their preparation, they did not include who they could get to roll away the huge stone that had been placed in front of the tomb. The sepulcher was a small area cut out into the side of a hill or a mountain that was used for a tomb to bury the dead. In ancient times, they were made with existing caves. The huge circular stone set in a groove in front of the tomb. Mark is the only gospel writer who records the women's concern over that problem. But they stepped out in faith, truly believing God would make a way when they could not see their way. All they cared about was anointing the dead body of Jesus. And they just saw the stone as an obstacle they had to overcome. Jewish scholars estimated the stone weighed over a ton in weight. The stone was so heavy these women couldn't move it by themselves. Such a stone was used for the graves of rich people to prevent grave robbers and grave looters from getting in there and taking uh, possessions or valuables that, have met, that may have been buried with their loved ones. Remember, this gravesite belonged to a local rich person by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Also, the women didn't know. The Jews had Pilate to seal the tomb as well as place some guards in front of it. So no one could steal Christ's body 
and claim he was alive instead of the women coming up with an excuse they shouldn't go why they shouldn't go to the tomb they still went anyhow and they went with great expectation and i'm quite sure they were some praying women praying for divine intervention and according to verse four upon their arrival at the grave site the woman the women looked and they saw that the huge stone had been rolled away sometimes we just worry over unnecessary things Faith is all about making that first step, doing the impossible. Well, when we do the possible, that's when God does the impossible. But we've got to believe in God to do the impossible. We've got to expect God to do the impossible. And I don't know about you, but I found out in life, most of the things that I worry about never happens in the first place. Even if those bad things didn't happen, they weren't as bad as I thought they would be. Here were these women who had probably worried all night long concerning how they were going to deal with this heavy, huge stone and the problem had already been dealt with before they even got there. Matthew explains how this happened. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the huge stone from the door and sat upon it. Obviously, the stone wasn't rolled away in order to let Christ out, but the stone was rolled away in order to let the women come in to see that he was not there. For it was very great, is basically talking about the stones was so large they couldn't, they could see it had been rolled away from a distance. Even before they got there, they had seen that the stone had been rolled away. These things contributed to the resurrection, uh, to their resurrection faith. Faith doesn't re rest on speculation. Faith doesn't rest on our opinion but it rests on truth and it rests on biblical facts. Living in this materialistic world, we allow many spiritual stones to separate us from God. They block the door to our hearts and it keeps us from loving Jesus the way that we should love him. We must pray and ask the Lord to remove these stones so we can faithfully follow him. Then we find in verse 5, realizing the stone had been rolled away, the women entered into the sepulcher. This is a reference to the tomb outer room that led to the inner burial chamber, it was there they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. Matthew says this young man was an angel. Mark says this was a young man. Luke says there were two men, but this is no contradiction. They were all inspired by the Spirit of God to write their account of the story. If you ever interview more than one witness to any event, you rarely get exactly 
the same details. If every witness tell the exact same story, one first thought is they got together to collaborate their stories. The fact that different accounts of this story varies gives support to the fact there was more than one witness recalling this powerful story concerning Christ's resurrection. Matthew says their clothing was white as snow. Mark says he had on a long white garment. Luke says their raiments was shining garments. All of the gospel writers truly believe these men were angels or messengers from God with a divine message. But angels were heavenly beings who were superior to human beings in power and intelligence. They existed for three reasons, to worship and glorify God, to minister to human beings, and to serve as God's messengers. The text suggests these women wasn't really excited, but they were affrighted. This meant they were trembling. They were terrified. And we can't be too hard on them because if you went to a cemetery that early in the morning, while it was still dark and somebody suddenly appeared in front of you dressed in white, you will be terrified and trembling too. Am I right about it? These women didn't say anything. They didn't ask any questions, but they just listened. Now, according to John's account, Mary Magdalene goes to the disciples and tell them somebody has stolen Christ's body. She couldn't imagine there had been a resurrection. And this brings us to the second section of our lesson outline entitled, The Faith of the Women After the Announcement of the Angel at the Tomb. And it is found in verses six through eight. According to Mark in verses six and seven, the angel's message seems too good to be true. Remember, this is a message from God, not really the angel. The Lord tells these women not to be afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. And this particular angel explained the mystery that confronted these women. Even before they could ask one question, the angel explains everything in three simply, simple words. He is risen. The Jesus you are looking for is no longer dead, but he is alive. Come check out the place where they laid him. This was God's way of getting the credit for the missing body of Christ, and no one else could have taken it. Jesus himself had gotten up and had exited the tomb just as he said that he would. Go your way literally means leave now and depart or be gone. It seems to denote an urgency suggesting that these women should waste no more time hanging around an empty tomb but they were to go and do what they had been instructed. 
They were to go and tell Christ's disciples as well as Peter. They would find Jesus in Galilee. This is a reference to the promise Christ made in the upper room in Jerusalem. Think of the last time those disciples saw Jesus. Think of how they responded and what was probably going through their minds, especially Peter's. He had denied knowing his master and his Lord three times. Even though they may have considered themselves a failure, Jesus did not give up on them. Even though they didn't support him when he was going through what he was going through, that he didn't stop encouraging them. He kept on reaching out to them and trying to console them because he knew he was not going to be with them very much longer. God the Father sent a message too good to be true. Jesus was going ahead of them to Galilee and he would be waiting for them there. Eventually, our Lord and Savior had already forgiven Peter before Peter had even asked for forgiveness. Resurrection faith, like all faith, is only found in God. But if Christ's resurrection seems too good to be true, then think about our Lord forgiving us for doubting, for questioning, and for walking away from it. Sometimes being forgiven seems too good to be true. Then we find in verse 8, our very last verse that we're going to talk about today, how the women found an empty tomb and how they responded. Mark said, they went out quickly and they fled from the sepulcher. The word fled here means they ran away very fast. It's the same word used in Matthew 26, 56, when the disciples fled in the Garden of Gethsemane. These women fled from the tomb in the same manner that the disciples fled when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. At the empty tomb, the women were told, tell his disciples, but like many of us, we fear sharing the greatest news in the world, the gospel of Jesus the Christ. After everything they saw for themselves, after everything they heard with their own ears, it just sounded too good to be true. So they left the grave site in fear. And this lets us know something about resurrection faith. It takes time. It takes obedience. It takes forgiveness. It really takes courage. And let me conclude and summarize this wonderful lesson by saying the following. There's no greater success story than Christ's resurrection, where tragedy was transformed into victory. The essence of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried then he was raised from the grave to never, ever die again. Where do you stand, my beloved, today in regards to your resurrection faith? Do you believe it's 
Uh, this is a very powerful, powerful story. Do you believe in what Christ did? Do you believe in what the women saw and what they heard? Have you read the scriptures and considered everything Jesus had said about his death, about his burial, and about his resurrection? If you have read and believed, thank God today that you have some resurrection faith. Now, once again, you are in the know of our Sunday school lesson entitled The Resurrection Key to Faith. And if this lesson has benefited and blessed you, please let me know by clicking that like button. Leave a comment if you desire and share it with others and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. Once again, thank you for tuning in and watching. As usual, let us close out with prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for raising your son from the dead. We thank you for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's because of Christ. All of our sins can be forgiven, and we have been given another opportunity to have a right relationship with you. Help us to experience his resurrection power each and every day of our lives. It's in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen.